you for inviting us to share our story of Gold Star here. We have been blessed by the entire state of Connecticut as they have graciously yes, that's the word, <laughs> honored and embraced Larry and our family over the past 13 years. As we recount this journey, our, we may have voices that shake with teary eyes, but we want you to know that one of our greatest comforts is to share Larry's story. In doing so, we keep his memory alive and bring acknowledgement of the sacrifices made by all of America's sons and daughters, those who have fallen and those who come home wounded, physically and invisibly. Larry cared deeply for those who served with him. We feel that the greatest way that we can honor him and others like him is to pick up that torch that he laid down. We look to bring respect and care as he did for his brothers and sisters, those serving from the past, the present, and the future. Ray and I are both veterans. I grew up in a strong military family. I like to say that I am a product of the armed forces family business. Not only did my father, a combat veteran of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, my four siblings and I served, but I went on to pad my veteran resume by becoming a military spouse Together we raised two sons who became Marines. I have many memories of growing up on military bases. Military families then and those today operate in a similar fashion. The moms hold their families together as single moms. The dads are often away from home, missing birthdays, holidays, and all the children's firsts. Though my mom and us children did not wear uniforms, we were expected to respect the military customs and conform to the rules of where to live, where to go to the doctor, where to go to school, and to stand at attention at the same task. We learned how to double time, how to hurry up and wait, and how to pack up and move to another base again. When you are raised in that environment and your mom becomes the drill sergeant of your family, a byproduct is resilience, and the only challenge of basic training, it turns out, is the physical aspect. After surviving basic training as a non-athlete, I received French language training and voice interceptor instruction. I did not end up at the embassy in Belgium, as I was promised by the recruiter. However, I did end up at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where I met my tall, handsome soldier. Ray was trained to be an electronic warfare event interceptor. His two brothers served in the Air Force. His brother Larry was a Vietnam veteran. We had a short December to May courtship, and we married on May 8th of 1981. In 1983, we were blessed to bring Larry into the world. In that same year, we ended our military service. For 21 years, I had been government property, and I was free at last. Perhaps because we served during times of peace, our re-entry into the civilian life was eased by the love of family and the fact that we had each other as peers. We became a typical West Hartford family and we happily added our daughter Emily and our son Brian into the mix. Our family was flourishing and nestled in a world far away from the military. As for Larry, he was filled with boundless energy, and his antics supplied much laughter throughout his entire life. In his youth, Larry excelled in most sports that he played. He was recruited to be a hockey goalie for his freshman year at Connor High School. By his sophomore year, he was the starting goalie and retained that position through the rest of his high school career. In 2001, he was selected Hartford Current Honorable Mention All-State Goalie. He also took up lacrosse and turned out to be a great, fast defenseman, earning CCC West all the honors. During his high school years, he worked at Veterans Memorial Ice Rink and during the summer served as a town camp counselor. Larry graduated from Conard in 2001 and entered Central Connecticut State University that fall on September 5th. Just six days later, September 11th, 2001, the lives of all Americans changed drastically. On that day, our son, who had been sports-focused, humorous, and carefree, 
sat in front of the television and watched the towers fall, the decimation of the Pentagon, and the burning rubble in Pennsylvania. As we have learned from other Gold Star families, the military was not a consideration in the lives of many warriors until that day. One and a half years later, Larry announced that he would be leaving college and joining the Marines. We were in the military again. Only this time we were on the outside and about to embark on a journey that would reveal to us the true reality of being a combat veteran, the veritable meaning of a hero, and the excruciating mood of the greatest love. On May 19, 2003, Mary left for Paris Island. It was a long 13 weeks. Team sports served him well in his success at boot camp. He loved the training and would actually accompany punished recruits into the sandbox to endure the grueling PT that was dished out. He enjoyed, he enjoyed attending chapel and became a champion pugil stick person, course, on the course. <laughs> to our delight, he was selected to serve at Marine Barracks 8th and I in Washington, D.C. You cannot imagine our relief to think that he was not going to war. Larry graduated from Marine Corps boot camp on August 14th, and we brought home a changed man. Impeccable manners, tucked in shirts, with genuine appreciation for his family, his community, and respect for our nation and the military. I love the memory of leaving a restaurant and Larry running back in because he saw a gentleman in a, a red Marine jacket. He was hunched over, and Larry just needed to go in there and say, shake his hand and say, Semper Fi. Um, it, it, it's an instant bond, as we all know, when you run into someone else. It is the sacrifices and bravery of those who have gone before that help to mold the hearts of today's warriors. In Washington, D.C., Larry trained as a guide on bearer for the color guard. Among his duties, he served at Arlington National Cemetery and participated in Marine Corps burials. On one of our visits to D.C., Larry took us to Arlington, and he told us that if anything ever happened to him, that is where he would want to be laid to rest. Larry's other duty in D.C. was that of being a body bearer at Dover. He called home with a voice that was not quick with wit. He was heartstruck that one of the bags he had to unload was labeled with a name that he recognized from basic training, and it only had a body part. Inside. During his assignment in D.C., he toured the United States with the silent drill team, and he was the Marine Barracks Guide on Bearer in President Ronald Reagan's funeral procession. He had learned about President Reagan in his history class, and that connection made his, parti his participation the highlight of his career. Being a pretty boy, as Larry described it, ran its course, and hearing from his peers from BASIC, who were already deployed at war, filled him with a steadfast drive to do his part. He began pleading to be reassigned to Iraq. In January of 2005, Larry received his orders to report to Camp Lejeune. He came home to say goodbye, and he was beautifully honored at the ice skating rink where he had worked and skated. His brother Brian, and a Connor hockey defenseman, and his best friend and Marine brother and now West Hartford firefighter Ryan Shea stood beside him on the ice. It is a cherished memory. We have a picture of that up here. The notice of Larry's departure to Iraq was sudden, and at the last moment, Ray was able to get a ticket for me to go to see him off. Larry was very protective of me. And as we gathered with his brothers in arms, he was quick to silence their choice of language. <laughs> I was especially touched when he pointed out a young man to me who would be on his team. He, his words were, Mom, you will really like him. His name is Emmanuel. When it came time to say goodbye, I prayed to speak clearly and to remain calm. I was amazed at the sudden peace that poured over me in that moment. I was able to look Larry into the eye and tell him how much we loved him and how proud we were of him and that we would pray him safely home. On February 20th, 2005, I watched our son march single file onto a bus. I distinctly remember thinking 
How silly that I ever cried when I placed him on a bus as a child to go to school. I'm watching our son and the sons of others board a bus to go to war. Larry had called me every day when he was stationed stateside. He would call me from bars, riding on the metro, the barracks, the parade field. I feel sometimes that his heart was compelled to call so often because there would come a time when the phone would be silent. In Iraq, his calls were few, and on his last call home, he informed us that he had been assigned the position of team leader. He expressed his hesitance to have the responsibility of directing others into harm's way. He asked for prayer. Larry had a protector's soul. May 8, 2005 was the first day of Operation Matador. Larry's unit was passing by the town of New Ubaidi near the Syrian border. The Army was building a bridge when they came under fire. The Marines of 3-2 were called to assist. During the chaos of dismounting from their armored vehicle, Larry was specifically noticed as sprinting, no doubt a carryover from his time on the lacrosse field. Larry's team made their way from house to house to root out insurgents. When they came to the last house, Larry assumed the point man position, busted down the door, and was met with insurgent machine gun fire. The two Marines and corpsmen behind him had just enough time to dive out of the line of fire and escaped with disabling wounds. The following is a citation that Larry received posthumously with the Navy and Marine Corps Accommodation Medal with Valor. New Ubaid, Iraq. During Operation Matador, Lance Corporal Philippon dismounted his team from an amphibious assault vehicle into heavy enemy fire. Disregarding his own personal safety, he directed the suppression of enemy positions to enable his platoon to gain a foothold at the edge of the city. Although he was a team leader, Lance Corporal Philippon assumed the point man position to lead his team during the clearing of buildings occupied by insurgents. Upon entering one of these buildings, he was fatally wounded by enemy machine gun fire. Lance Corporal Philippon's actions saved the lives of the two Marines and the one corpsman following him. Lance Corporal Philippon's initiative, courage, and devotion to duty reflected credit upon himself and upheld the highest traditions of the Marine Corps and the United States Naval Service. It was May 8th. It was Mother's Day. And it's also our 24th wedding anniversary. At 5.30 a.m. I woke as Lisa made a startling sound in her sleep. Across the world in Iraq, it was 12.30 p.m. My son was gone. God had called him home. We did not receive word until that evening. The day, however, was odd. We grieved for the mothers across the land who had lost their children in this war. Little did we know that our names had been added to that list. At 9 that evening, Captain Brian Latendre and Gunny Palmer made the long walk to our front door. The pain on their faces revealed the respect and love for a brother and a family they had never met. Captain Latendre proceeded to speak the scripted words to us. Mr. and Mrs. Philippon, I have been directed by the President of the United States and the Commandant of the Marine Corps to inform you that today at 0530, your son Lance Corporal Lawrence Robert Philippon was killed. And we've done this one. Of Iraqi freedom. It was then that the door of our life opened to God's mercy, grace, and provision. Our family, friends, church, the town of West Hartford, state officials and citizens, strangers and military personnel flooded into our lives. Bring comfort. The media was certainly present as well. The deaths of those who are public service are public deaths. When Larry raised his hand to take the oath of duty, he became a son of every American, as do all others who take that oath. They make us all family, and their passing is a shared public cross to bear. Captain Latendre accompanied us to Arlington to bury Larry, and those who had served with Larry in D.C. waited his arrival. They requested to honor him with an officer's burial, but was denied. So they created a ceremony far surpassing any ceremony ever conducted in Arlington. The streets were lined 
was saluting the terrible Marines as his hearse passed by. Larry was laid to rest in Section 60. On May 3, 2006, we were informed that our beloved Captain Lintendra was also killed in Iraq, helping to train friendly forces. He now rests one row up from Larry. We remain in contact with Larry Marine friends and friends here at home. It seems like every year a new contact is made. We welcome them with open arms into our family. We love to hear the stories that they tell. Larry's friend Emmanuel told us that he taught Larry about Larry had taught him about the stars, and he in turn taught Larry Bible stories and said Larry would read his Bible in the watchtower. Emmanuel means God with us. And there are funny stories, too. While sitting around discussing heaven, Larry indicated that he was sure that when he got there, only little wings would be left. And they would still love to tell a story about big, tall Larry with tiny wings. <laughs> the comments after Larry's death brought us great comfort. The following email dated May 15, 2005, from Larry's first sergeant at Iraq to his color guard unit in Washington, D.C., reads, Philippon was a team leader. He loved being a Marine and was good at it. He had the courage to run face first into a machine gun. Squad leaders don't normally go in first. Philippon did. Where do men like this come from? One of the correspondences came from a Marine that had served with Larry in Iraq on Memorial Day night in 2014. It speaks about Larry, but we, all, we feel it gives a glimpse into the hearts of all those who lose battle buddies. And it reads, I've wanted to send this message many times over the years, but tonight, after enjoying my Memorial Day with friends and telling Larry's story to my wife, I finally found the words. Larry and I checked into 3 2 the same day. We both went to Kilo, but different platoons. However, we had that new guy bond of checking in the same day, so we were instant friends. I remember standing post with him and talking about everything from his family and the woman he intended to marry when he got home. Etc. I was also there the day he died. I was a team leader providing security on a rooftop directly across from the house where it happened. I have lived every day of my life in his honor. He was truly one of the best men I have known, and I am happy to call him my brother. I know that Larry gave his life for me, and every one of us that were there that day, so that we could live our lives to be successful. I know I will never forget that day. I've spent every day of my life trying to live as much as possible, chasing my dreams and living my life to the fullest in his honor. I have, a worn, I have worn a bracelet with his name on it for almost a decade now, and not one day goes by without me thinking about the amazing man your son was. How he was better than me, had a brighter future, and everything going his way, and how he laid it all down, so that I might live my life. I can't imagine the sacrifice your family has made or how, sorry. Don't be sorry. <coughs> or how hard it is to be a mother and lose your son, a mother's son. We work good together, don't we? <laughs> I'm very thankful to have great men like your son in my life and to call him my brother. I would gladly lay down my life a thousand times if I could bring him back, as I am sure he would have done amazing things much greater than I can hope to accomplish with his life. I can't thank you and your family enough for not only Larry's service, but that of his brother as well. I told my wife about Larry and how he inspired me to cherish every moment of my life. I have achieved almost everything I wanted personally and professionally and attributed it all to your son. Every time life gets hard or I'm faced with a tough decision, I think about that goofy, smiling face and go full bore after my dreams as I know that that is what he would want. And that <clears throat> by living my life to the fullest is the only real way to honor him. I'm proud to call your son my friend, and I want to let you know how much he has inspired me. I will never forget the 8th of May, 2005, or the sacrifices your family has made. Semper Fi. We have been working... <laughs> We 
we have been working with an author who is writing a book about Larry's unit. His interviews with those Marines who are with Philippon, as they call him, has been heartbreaking and raw. To read the account of Larry's death, their heroic acts to retrieve his body, and the love they express for Larry makes us cherish and respect them even more. We couldn't be with Larry when he was taken from this earth. We believe God placed him amid, amid brothers who love him and will carry his memory and legacy safely through the rest of their lives. But they will also carry the horror of that day and the battles and losses they endured for the rest of their deployment. These men have cried in our arms, and we have listened in the middle of the night when they have called in distress. The demons they battle are real, and the guilt of survival has at times overpowered them. They've lost brothers on the battlefield and at home. The unspoken bond that they share and the legacy they carry is like no other. That legacy is one of honor. It has been passed down through the ages from warrior to warrior. It's in each of your hearts here today. I just had that in here. Each looking into the looking to the history of those who went before them, drawing on their strength and courage, your strength and courage. It is a legacy that cannot be ignored, and we are forever blessed as a nation to have individuals who answer the call to give up their lives if, if necessary to preserve our freedoms. Our family was diminished with the loss of Larry, yet at the same time it grew exponentially with the military family that continues to wrap their arms around us and to carry us for their brother Philippon. We feel strongly that it is our duty as a nation, as citizens and on behalf of our fallen, to pick up the torch of guardianship and diligently care for those brothers and sisters in arms who make it home. These sons and daughters of America are the very population who we credit for the protection of our freedoms, our safety to sleep soundly at night, their assistance when we endure natural disasters or address terror from within. We watch the heartwarming reunions on TV and social media when our troops return home. It feels good and we may even shed tears to see them run into the arms of their families with smiles, tears of happiness, and hugs. And those wonderful reunions have been made possible by our Vietnam veterans as they strive to bring the current warriors home with proper honor and respect. They know all too well the additional stabbing wounds of war when your country does not welcome you home. Sadly, what we don't see but must address is the battle that emerges in the lives of many of our servicemen and women after the homecoming. As quoted in the service, our men and women are trained to go to war. They're not trained to come home. I have been blessed since Larry's death to carry a torch and work with our veterans at the Rocky Hill Veterans Home and now with Resilience Grows Here, a veteran initiative in the Farmington Valley. Our mission is to create communities that foster the health and resilience of veterans across their lifespan. We are striving to educate communities about the strengths, values, and challenges our men and women bring back to their civilian lives. We are dedicated to walk beside them, and we feel that others want to do the same. This past summer, I attended a moral injury conference at the Soldiers Heart Institute in New York. Moral injury is emerging as the signature wound of these current wars. It can be simply described as an injury to the soul. Though some symptoms are the same as PTSD, the feelings of guilt of survival, the shame of taking a life, depression, and conflicts with their moral compass or code of conduct are overwhelming. And they don't respond to the same, moral injury does not respond to the same treatments as PTSD. One of the speakers was Dr. Roger Brook, a professor of psychology and the founder and director of military psychological services at Duquesne University. In an article in the PTSD journal, he tells us that ancient cultures recognized that becoming a warrior set a person on a different path that would last throughout their lifetime. They ritualized and honored their warriors and helped them to carry the burden of their war experience. He goes on to say that our own society has not done well at that. 
He also referenced the Plains Indians who honored the souls of those killed on the battlefield, including their enemies. Dr. Brooks has worked with many veterans whose dreams are haunted by the faces of the enemy. Our goal today is to encourage us all to walk beside those who serve or have served. Today, less than one half of one percent of our population serves. It turns out that most of those who serve come from military families. Therefore, many who do not serve in our armed forces may gain their knowledge of military service from movies, social media, and news stories as opposed to personal connections. This has allowed a cavernous divide between our military and those being protected. Misperceptions of our troops make their transitions home from service all the more difficult. Other aspects contributing to a decline in those who serve are the stresses being placed on our troops and upon their families. Multiple deployments, long separations of family, lack of adequate child care, and the unemployment rate for military spouses due to constant moves are taking their toll. As military service loses its ground as a civic duty or, or as a profession of honor, recruiters conducting their duties to find qualifying individuals to serve are often met with slam doors, angry, fear-filled parents, and a total lack of respect. And then there is a statistic that 75% of our nation's youth do not qualify to serve their country. I want to add that we have met many an individual who regrets not having been able to serve because they did not have the blessing of their family. And we have spoken to those who have served against their family's wishes, and that is a burden no one should have to carry into battle. If our ser servicemen and women are the ones who are perpetuating a sense of obligation to serve in the military, it is only fitting that our civic duty is to be concerned about their the circumstances and challenges that our troops are facing. We need to invest in responding better to their needs. A simple thank you will never be sufficient. There are countless wounds who have wounded who have come home to a battlefield of living with disabilities, missing limbs, pain, psychological injury, and isolation. In speaking with the veterans from this area, the biggest challenge is returning home to bridge the gap between their military experience and their post-military life. They're, they feel they are starting at square one and have to start life all over again. Combined with post-traumatic stress and moral injury, the struggle is magnified. I am a member of the Valhalla Motorcycle Club, and we are blessed today to have two of my brothers, Jay and Vern. Our work to support veterans has given us the opportunity to make a difference in their lives, and we have gained greater insight into their struggles. We urge you to take hold of torches laid down by our fallen, learn suicide awareness skills, research the resources that are available in your community for veterans, and be ready to stand in the gap for them with encouragement, care, and understanding. For our troops and our entire population, we need to address all forms of mental health and strive to remove the stigmas that stifle the quality of life for those who are faced with overwhelming mental challenges. We encourage you to learn about their struggles. We encourage your businesses and communities to support and embrace them when they return home. Readjusting to civilian life is difficult. They can't do it alone. What do we call these individuals who answer the call on our behalf? They are much more than a warrior or a veteran. They raise their hand and they take an oath to defend and protect. They basically say, send me instead of your loved ones. Our men and women who serve, the sons and daughters of America, consider us either family or friends. Tragically, some do not come home. There are over 7,000 combat deaths from Iraq and Afghanistan. And I, I have to add in, from across all of the other wars, the, the numbers are just unconscionable. And each one of those individuals has a story, just like our son. For those who do return home, we celebrate with Thanksgiving. We thrive because of your selfless service in the highest way to honor your fallen comrades. And thank you for your service is to ensure that you come home to understanding communities and lead successful and fulfilling <coughs> lives. We must work harder to address the increasing number of suicides a day among our military population. 22 a day is a conservative number as it doesn't include those on active duty 
and those serving in the National Guard. Our military men and women, past, present, and future, you all are national treasures. There is a familiar quote that reads, a veteran is someone who at one point in their life wrote a blank check payable to the United States of America for an amount up to and including their life. That caliber of civic duty mirrors the words of Jesus in John 15, 13 through 14. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for their friends. You are my friends. We have two other children. Our daughter Emily was a senior at Connor the year her brother was killed. She has grown into a strong woman advocating for adults with learning challenges and was married three years ago. Our younger son Brian was a freshman at Connor that year. The years between Larry and Brian were just starting to close. After graduation from high school and a year at college, Brian joined the Marine Corps Reserves. His desire to walk where his brother had walked and the brotherhood that he would gain gave us the strength to give him our blessing. He recently ended his commitment. Larry's high school friends formed a lacrosse team named Team Goat that plays in the Glastonbury Tournament every July. They have been together for 11 years. As the original members age and begin families, new players are brought in from Connor High School lacrosse team. And recently, talented players from across the lacrosse community have asked to be on Larry's team. They play to honor Larry, and their team effort exemplifies all that Larry loved about sports. For 12 years, we hosted a dance at the VFW in West Hartford to raise money for Larry's scholarship. As Larry played town-wide sports, students from Conrad and Hall received the Lance Corporal Lawrence R. Philippon Memorial Scholarship. Portions of the funds raised have also been given to Operation Smile. Larry's smile was taken from us. Through the generosity of those who desire to honor Larry's sacrifice, over 230 smile procedures have brought beautiful, life-changing smiles to children across the globe. Larry's laugh, smile lives on. There is not a day that goes by that we don't miss Larry or feel his presence. It may be his athletic number of number 33, which, by the way, Larry had chosen that in middle school. He came home one day and he said, I like the number 33. It may have been because of Larry Bird. But um, we told him that that was the age of Christ when he died for us. And from then on, Larry chose that number. If you look... I don't have the picture here. We have a picture. Larry was issued his M16 um, the night that he left, and he came trotting back up to me and showing it to me with such pride they had issued him rifle number 33. <laughs> when we see 33 on license plates, on signs, on cash register receipts, or um, Larry loved bird watching, and so we'll see him perched as a hawk on a post sometimes. <laughs> Larry was our hero long before he became a Marine. He left us with many precious memories of love and laughter. Evil took him from us, but we have witnessed how God has taken what was meant for evil and turned it for the good. Love doesn't die. For those that did not come home, President Reagan's quote on Veterans Day 1985 speaks to the loss of their lives. They gave up two lives, the one they were living and the one they would have lived. When they died, they gave up their chance to be husbands and fathers and grandfathers. They gave up their chance to be revered old men. They gave up everything for their country, for us. All we can do is remember. Ray and I would like to add to that quote because we feel we can do more than just remember. We can ensure that the brothers and sisters in arms of our fallen are properly cared for and always honored when they come home. Thank you, and God bless you. May you welcome your questions.